I love vanilla ice cream. Black walnut, butter pecan, I love ice cream. Ice cream is what people did on Sundays. Everybody would go home after church, you would eat, and then later on, the parents would take the children over there to eat ice cream. It was just a tradition. Everyone went there. I meet people today that are my age. It's, oh, I used to go to the Royal Ice Cream Company. Of course, at that time, it was segregated. Durham, in terms of its race relations history, was a place that did not witness the kind of overt racial oppression that would be seen down east in North Carolina or in South Carolina. Uh, it was much more a uh, place where people understood the ground rules and obeyed them, and it was very much a class-based thing. There was a thriving, successful black business community in Durham, fed in part by institutions like Mechanics and Farmers Bank, a black-owned bank, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, the largest black-owned insurance company in the United States. So, I mean, it was a segregated society, but one where blacks had learned to thrive and prosper and build their own institutions, and where blacks had a middle-class lifestyle in the segregated South. Reverend Douglas Moore had come to Durham from the town of Hickory. He left North Carolina Central and went to Boston University for graduate school. And while at Boston University, he met Martin Luther King Jr. It was important for us to begin to make some movement. And so we were going to put the, the bulk of it on the South. We came to the conclusion that uh, there were enough people in North Carolina who would make a difference. People used to ask me, say, well, why are you doing this? I said, why, why aren't you doing it? Uh, uh, I said, oh, cause you're scared, aren't you? Well, yeah, I said, I'm not scared. I'm not supposed to be afraid. And when you know what you're doing, you will not be afraid. In fact, I believe now, right now, you're ready. All of us felt the same thing inside. There need to be a change. The colored and white fountains had to go away. The colored and white bathrooms had to go away. The colored sit in the rear of the bus had to go away. I said, this is what we're faced with. People are sick and tired of going in the back door to get two cents worth of ice cream. My father owned the Royal Ice Cream Company from 1927 until 1958. His father was an ice cream gelato maker in Italy. The Royal Ice Cream Company was popular just to both black and white. The relationship we had with blacks, to the best of my knowledge, was very good. However, you must understand, I was looking at it from a white perspective not knowing how the black person felt at that time. I think that folks thought that the Royal Ice Cream Parlor might be a good place to start. Even though it was a segregated ice cream parlor, it did sit very, very closely to the black neighborhood. There was a door on Dowd Street, that is where the white people entered. There was a door on Roxborough Street at the back of the building and that was where we entered. We, on the white side you could sit down and enjoy the meal. On the uh, black side there were either stools or you stood and got your ice cream and moved on the outside. We knew that there was a swinging door and we knew that once you pushed that door it swung both ways. So the idea was whoever go through that swinging door first don't let it close, just push it open and just keep coming until all of us were in and seated. It was back and forth between the waiter and the manager. The manager never said anything to us. He came out and got a good look. Then he would go back in his office. And of course, I knew that the guy who, who owned the place, uh, the way he was looking, I said, to he is scared as hell. And finally, the waiter got down to the booth I was sitting in. He said the manager did not want to serve us and he would like for us to leave. But nobody moved. They didn't understand that we wait there all day. And we kept asking for ice cream. 
My Uncle Lou was in the building that day, but as I understand it, he didn't really want to get involved. <laughs> he told Bill Allen, his son-in-law, to do all the, Bill called the police and so forth and so on, and handed, Uncle Louie stayed in the office from what I understand. We had the choice booth, because we were sitting where we could see traffic coming both ways. We saw the police coming. There were seven of us, there were eight police there. One of them just looked at me and said, if you were my daughter, I would take you across my lap and spank you. And that's when I said, if I were your daughter, I wouldn't be here for this. I would have been over there eating ice cream and gone home. Because if I'd been his daughter, I'd been white. It must have been something monumental, I mean, to challenge the whole concept of segregation by young people who believed in Reverend Moore enough to try this. We were remarkable and unique here in Durham that we did not encounter violence. They were able to work together to integrate facilities here in Durham before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. I think this was a very special group of young people who we ought to applaud every time we pass that historical marker. I think they have been overlooked historically, and it's unfortunate. There were people that were involved in Greensboro that were aware of the Durham sit-ins, but it's one of those asterisks in history due to the fact that there weren't people there with live action cameras to put it on the national news. It would have been a success either way. If he had served us ice cream, it would have been a success. The fact that we didn't leave was a success too, so either way it was a success.